Um, today my talk is going to be about uh, industrial design in entertainment. So who, what, why? I'm an industrial designer, uh, an art director in the entertainment industry, and what do I do? I create technical designs and I provide consultation for world creation. Um, and why do I do all this stuff? Why am I talking today? Is that I have a strong belief that industrial design is an important component in creating rich, meaningful experiences. And I know that that's kind of hypocritical, considering that, um, that basically my portfolio online, if any of you have seen it, is effectively filled with the absolute opposite of rich, meaningful experiences. If you are familiar with my stuff, you know that I just make very, very, very hard, cold, technical things. Um, you know, vehicles and things for uh, kind of video games and m military mechanical stuff. It's, none of this is meaningful or rich or, or emotionally relevant. Um, but this stuff here that I'm showing, that's on my, on my uh, website and on my art station and whatnot, as we all know, we're usually years behind in what we can show. And the last few years for me has been really exciting, but I can't show anything. And I'm gonna try and get across some of the things that I've learned in the last few years uh, by actually looking at other people's work instead of showing my own. Um, so today I wanna share some theories on embedding richness in our designs. Uh, and that's about turning logic into enriching emotion. Um, so I'm going to explain the origins of what I will talk about today by just quickly going through how I got to this position, which is when I was 17, I got Photoshop, my first tool, uh, and a Wacom, and I was doing these, these images that were technically really kind of lame, but the sentiment of them was quite, uh, I really wanted to paint pictures that sort of gave some sort of storytelling, and it wasn't a conscious decision. I was just doing that because I was a teenager and I was psyched on all the stuff I was seeing. And I was fascinated to learn more and more tools, um, and this is like my first uh, screenshot in Max when I was learning how to do modeling. Uh, so I, I was basically just looking at these tools and thinking like, wow, I, you know, I could, uh, uh, I could basically um, get more and more accurate. That was my goal. New tools, more accuracy, brilliant, whatever. Um, so I kept on doing these mechanical things and I, I started to learn animation. And I'm just gonna quickly show uh, just one animation here just to give you a gist of something that I've never, I never actually shown. Um, but uh, kind of I started to learn like rigging and I was using it as a way to start understanding how to design things as well because I was trying to understand how to connect mechanical things and how to make them actually work since that's the basis of a good mechanical design is that things should work. And here I was learning about pivot points and intersecting pieces and learning a lot about everything that was breaking as soon as you put a design into an animation. And that became critical for me to understand that when you're designing something uh, mechanical, you're designing it for, for its end uh, situation, which isn't just looking good in a concept. It has to work. Um, I'd gone from drawing pictures really colorful with people in these scenes to uh, working on like extremely detailed uh, finger parts for a, a robot mech hand. Um, and the, and then when I went into the industry, I was making low-level props, and I have no issue with this, but the, the thing that was uh, bugging me deep down was knowing that these props weren't even contributing to something meaningful. It was, like, this was for Terminator Salvation, the, the franchise spin-off game, and seeing the inner workings of how that was going was kind of, you know, this isn't really, we're not making anything exciting here. And uh, then I moved on to oil drums. I was, I was still nerding out over the fact that I was making technical design, uh, but it was... I was losing sight of, you know, basically how did I go from this at 17 to this at 20? And I had to start asking myself some pretty fundamental questions, which is, like, why did I learn all these tools? Um, was it to make rusty barrels for Killzone? And deep down, there was something in me that was just saying, this isn't, like, I was pretty depressed. And I'm not saying that making uh, these props is, is a bad thing. It's actually, what I want to talk about today is that it can be a really beautiful thing if you can actually attach some meaning to it. And uh, that's kind of what I want to cover today. So to define the subject, I just want to quickly cover industrial design. It's the creative act of determining and defining a real world product's form, how something basically feels in, a, in you know, like an iPhone or something. But how is it done? It's, it's by establishing practical problems and then executing design solutions. So first of all, you need to identify what you're trying to fix and then find a, a, a neat solution. And then entertainment is a form of activity that holds the interest of an audience and provides pleasure. This is a Wikipedia definition. It provides pleasure or amusement. Now, 
I'm going to quickly segue into uh, a quick um, shorthand phrase that I use now uh, because of my interest in neuroscience and psychology um, and what pleasure, what we all think about the word pleasure. And I want to talk about in the 50s when neuroscience was first kicking off, uh, scientists were studying what parts of the brain provide uh, different emotions. And they identified a thing called the nucleus accumbens, which is responsible for giving us pleasure hits. Uh, it's, it's there, it's, it, it's what uh, we get when we take a, a hit of heroin, uh, crystal meth, have an orgasm. This part of the brain is what's kicking things off in terms of that, that hit. And uh, what they did with these rats was they uh, put an electrode in their heads and connected it directly to the nucleus accumbens to see what would be the end result. And the other end of the electrode was connected to a button that the rat could press. And what actually ended up happening, they found, was that the rat would become addicted to the button. Not just addicted, he would actually cross electrocuted flooring that put him through agony to get to this button just to satisfy his nucleus accumbens. It became an addiction in a way that when they took that electrode off and put food on the other side of that electrocuted floor, the rat was not motivated to go for the food because there was no button. So the reason I'm bringing this up is that the rat was pleasuring himself but ultimately, he was destroying himself at the same time. And I think we can all relate to pressing the button when we scroll down our Facebook feeds, that we are, pleasure, we are basically activating the pleasure center of our brain, but a large part of us is going, the fuck am I doing this for? Like, I'm not even interested in any of this shit. But you just keep on, just because there's something else there, your brain does give you a small hit because the nucleus accumbens, above all else, likes novelty. It likes a shift of attention. So anything new coming into its field of view, makes you feel satisfied, even if it's got no meaning. Um, so I want to go one step further than, than what the Wikipedia thing says. I think entertainment can go beyond simple gratification. Uh, in fact, I think it is, it should, we're responsible to take it beyond that, because it's dangerous to make people press the button uh, too much for its, for its own sake. So we can produce insight in the audience through story, empathy, and drama. And you're probably wondering how this connects to industrial design, but it does. Um, Blade Runner is an example of a, a film where we have all of that pleasure center stuff throughout the, the film. We have all those things that give us pleasure, like the, the various designs, colors, scenes, music, uh, all that stuff is in there. But we're still talking about it 30 years later because the story provided us with some richness that we can discuss and ponder over. The equivalent now in, in a science fiction world would be something like Transformers, which is basically the film world's version of a slot machine. And it's just very quick edits, lots of bright colors, lots of moving parts, exploding things. And it's there to keep us pinned to the screen, even though deep down we're wondering why the hell we bought the ticket in the first place. And that is where, for me, I think our entertainment industry is going desperately, desperately wrong. Uh, equivalent in the game industry would be The Last of Us, which provides all of those rewarding mechanics of the game design. Uh, it, it gives you all of those pleasure hits on the journey, but at the same time, those pleasure hits are coming along a journey of real uh, emotional growth and characters and all that good stuff. Compare that to Candy Crush, which is uh, very good technically at what it does, but its ultimate goal is to just keep people in a pleasure cycle loop. Now, the thing about pleasure is that it's short term, it's quick fix, it's amusement, it's forgettable, it's circular, and it's contextless. Uh, once you're not pressing that button, you're not getting pleasure, and you won't get any more pleasure until you press the button again. It's slavery. Happiness, however, is long term, life enriching, character building, perspective changing. It's a shared event, and it's contextual. And the contextual is what stories give you. It's narrative, it's meaning. So we can either make something where we provide pleasure, which is pressing a button endlessly, or we can provide happiness, being challenged and enriched by a meaningful experience. And we can have pleasure along the way. We definitely need pleasure along the way. But it shouldn't be the sole purpose of the designs that we make. So with that in mind, my new goal, which I've learned over the last few years, was to create design solutions that enable meaningful narrative to flourish. Our virtual world designs must work on two levels. So it, what I want to explain today is that uh, the first level they need to work on is designs must be functional and follow the logical rules of the virtual world. It seems self-evident, but this is really something we take for granted. If an audience is convinced by the logic of a design, if they're not consciously questioning its construction or you know, whether it even makes sense doing what it's doing, or whether it's animating correctly, or whether it would work as you expect it to work, 
then they can relax and they can invest in the experience of the story of the, the, the rest of the, the game world. And our designs are not meant to be the center of attention. They're meant to be supporting a whole fabric of other things. The second level, and this for me is the most important level now, is we must encode our designs with information that enhances the narrative. With our audience convinced with the virtual world's consistency, because we've made it logically OK, uh, we can then encode hidden information that is not intended for conscious awareness. OK, so with these two things together, they work in harmony. The first stage of making uh, a really good industrial design for entertainment is making a functional design that's following logical rules. We're, we're acknowledging universal principles to make your design credible. We all know what it's like when you see a design that just doesn't look right. It doesn't look right because it's not adhering to the rules that we expect. So I'm going to ask you the question, what do airliners and ketchup have in common? And they actually do have a lot in common, as much as many other things. And I'm going to start by telling you a story. Back in the 1950s, uh, it was the, the golden age of the beginning of jetliners. So back in the day, de Havilland, which was a, a, an airline company, they, uh, they made this, uh, this plane, which was nicknamed the Comet, which was basically the Airbus of its day. It was the most successful in its, in its very brief years. It was the most successful airliner, and it was the first jet airliner. And it was all going swimmingly well until um, they started to crash. And no one particularly knew why. Um, so beyond the crashes, after three happened, and no one could explain why, the whole fleet was grounded. So every single airline company in the world suddenly had to stop using the plane, which is financially kind of a big deal. So de Havilland went into panic mode, and they, they, they put all their engineers on it, and they were saying, what, what the hell is the problem? And the engineers were clueless, but they could understand that it definitely wasn't the wings or the engine, but it had to be with the fuselage. So what they decided to do was to create a simulation to turn an airframe and put it through thousands and thousands of simulated flight hours by putting it into a water tank and overpressuring and underpressuring the water tank to, to imitate the effect of cabin pressure going up in the air, coming back down repeatedly, repeatedly, repeatedly. So speeding up an evolution process uh, artificially. And sure enough, after a few thousand hours of simulated flight, they found a rupture. Well, they didn't find it, obviously made itself apparent. Um, and this rupture gave them a clue. They were like, right, well, we should probably look at the other three air crash sites and look at these components and see if there's a pattern here, see if this is related. Um, and they did, in fact, find a pattern. And the pattern was that uh, with all the three air crashes, there was the same crack between two windows. What they established was that uh, at the corners of windows, there was an issue with concentrated stress. And what they realized was a concept that they were familiar with, but they hadn't really taken seriously, which was stress concentration. Now, stress concentration is when any geometric discontinuities, corners, holes, notches, threads, basically they become a source of massive stress on an airframe. So when you start pulling, these arrows here represent strain of pulling apart. Now, when there's no obstruction, the stress lines are distributed evenly, and they basically create a, a, a glue for, to, for protecting the object from breaking. When you put something like a, a, an interruption in the geometry, it basically sends all of those stress lines to one point. And when it sends them to one point, that point's going to break pretty easily. So what they refer to this, to this as is stress rises. Okay, so if there's a nick or there's a hole or there's a, a, an unfortunate placement of a corner, then you could basically jeopardize an entire design. So the effective thing they learned was that square-shaped windows on an airplane leads to stress, and that leads to these failure origins. So at the corners, the, they were just breaking apart. And at the same time, they realized that stress at rivet holes for, is basically higher than normal, and that, in the case of the comet, they had rivet holes doubled up. So there was just a, it's basically a giant perfect storm of like, this thing's gonna crash eventually. And so that led to the actual stress increase in localized areas. So these stress, this, this red line here represents that between these rivet holes, there's just this perfect pathway for a crack. So the actual stress is above the predicted stress, the thing falls out of the sky. Now, I'm telling you this story about a 60-year-old plane because this design principle of how stress is uh, basically distributed across a metal surface is 
a universal principle. It can be used everywhere. It's not a trick, it's a principle that you can use when you consider what the way that you distribute a surface on a, on a mechanical object you're designing, where you put rivets, etc. Now, this leads me into uh, what we now have, which is these amazing digital simulations of stress. So, where it's blue, no stress. Where it's red, stress. So, you can see even with this example here, that the leveraging that's happening on the weight down is causing these areas to be very much vulnerable. So, and you can see there, that between the rivet hole and the corner, the red is leaking. So this is not a good thing. And what's good about these simulations is that they turn really cold, dry engineering stuff into visually understandable lessons. We can, you can look at that and you can actually puzzle solve for yourself where the problems are. This area here, a problem. But then you look at this area where it's got a cross beam, an angle, you know that there's no stress issues there. So you could actually adjust this design just by seeing this visually. You don't need to learn engineering. You don't need to study the physics of the universe. You just need to take advantage of engineers' lessons. So if I now use a quick, quick example here of a forklift truck, I want to show how looking at this forklift truck and this stress concentration, we could already imagine that at that corner there, they would probably be red. But I want to show how the understanding of this principle translates to something completely unrelated. Uh, hip replacements. Now, in the early days of hip replacements, uh, it was basically just a, what seems like a, I don't know, a DIY piece of metal that they've just screwed into someone's leg. Um, but the thing about these designs is, if you look at this design, this is a failed hip replacement. But the, the angle here, this is obviously accentuated because it's failed, but basically this design was originally up at sort of 20 degrees, and it collapsed because this, this area here that I'm pointing at, is a stress concentration area. So you don't put a hard corner in somewhere that's going to have to hold a lot of weight. The other thing about this is that these screws, we know from the rules of, of too many screws in delicate places, elevates the stress on the bone and the hip replacement. Uh, so the next variation of the hip replacement, they've gone right. Well, you know, the last corner failed, so we should probably make the corner a bit thicker. Same fundamental issue. Still a stress concentration point, it fails. So they've now turned it from a corner into a gradual change of direction for the hip bone replacement. Now this means that stress is diffused across the entire curve. This is most reminiscent of a modern day hip replacement. The, the principle that I want to sort of take, which is beyond the stress concentration thing here, is notice that this new variation from this to this, the only addition is this thing that sticks out that actually mimics the original hip bone. Evolution had already tested the hip for them. It had already made an amazing design. Nature is the ultimate engineer. Take advantage of millions of failed attempts. If, if nature has come up with a solution for something, try and retroactively work out why that's a good thing. Look at an egg. The, the, the egg shape has evolved to be perfect for supporting weight because the hen sits on it after she's given birth. It needs to support her weight. She doesn't want to crush her own chicks. But that principle is translatable to bridges. Another thing I want to say is that um, the world's rules, as in the virtual world that you're making, dictates what is right and wrong. But you have to use universal principles. So let's just say you're designing for a virtual world that is te technically primitive. It's, you know, maybe 100 years ago you design something that is full of flaws. Because 100 years ago, they were full of flaws. Now, make the design wrong for the virtual world that you're designing. If you don't know the principles, like the idea of stress concentration, then you don't have a variable to play with. When you know that function, you can vary it to your own benefit. Uh, and also, you may think that I'm using this as an example of just making tech. I'm not. Stress concentration has universal applications. On the left here, you see the ketchup. You notice the, the, the jaggedy edges at the top. That is intentional stress concentration, so you don't go nuts trying to get your sauce out of the packet. It has an application. And on the right, let's just say you're making an environment painting, and you're drawing a garden path with lots of uh, corners. You know exactly where to put your cracks, because that's where cracks naturally happen. So what I'm trying to say here is that these basic principles are what makes your environment convincing. It makes your design convincing. It makes your vehicle convincing. It makes anything convincing. And it's a universal principle. 
I'm not saying that this is for vehicles. I'm saying this is for everything. I think that you shouldn't be learning tricks. You shouldn't be copying uh, like surface attributes of stuff you see online. You should be learning the background, learn the principles. And it doesn't take a lot of stressful uh, study. I learned all this stuff from Discovery Channel. It, it, none of this is, I, I don't have a jot of understanding of real engineering. I didn't ever study industrial, in fact, I didn't even study. You shouldn't actually listen to me. I'm basically making this shit up. But the, the, the point is that uh, I do believe that if you learn the principles from the real world, then you've got this tool set to vary to your own advantage. And in the case of tech design, just because I'm a tech designer, if you want to make a, you know, an engineering product, then you need to emulate an engineer. You don't make up your own workflow based on thumbnails and what you see online. You, you say, right, if I'm going to make an engineered product, I think I maybe should look at the thousands of years of human development in engineering before I start making my new iPhone. And now I want to talk about the stuff that I feel is really important and completely missing specifically in the games industry right now. The film industry has done it, but it's doing it less and less and less now. Uh, but the encoded stuff is really, really exciting to me. So encoding uh, designs to enhance the narrative. So what we, what we want to do with our designs now is we want to connect narrative themes, what's happening in the story, the themes of the story, and we want to connect them with subconscious associations. What I want to use here is, is my pal Jody, and uh, she, we're going to look at certain examples of what she's been in where she's used the most humble and common industrial design object that you can think of, the chair. We're all sitting on them right now and how we can use that common industrial design product to enhance a narrative, to see the role that this humble design plays in scenes in films that we like. So I want to start with Silence of the Lambs, and I'm just going to quickly give some, some context for the scene that we're about to see. Jodie Foster is called Clarice. She's a female trainee FBI agent. She's still at school, and due to the fact that Buffalo Bill, a serial killer, uh, has kidnapped a senator's daughter, she's basically being uh, thrust into an investigation where the FBI thinks she, she can help, which is that she, they think that her, her, her um, being a young female will give her an advantage in getting into the mind of the girl that's been kidnapped. And they ask her to go and get inside the head of another serial killer, Hannibal the Cannibal, which is Anthony Hopkins. And she's sent to the prison to try and get inside his head and learn a bit about serial killers to try and find the senator's daughter. Now, this opening scene, I want to now just quickly say the narrative themes are that this is a psychological warfare scene here. This is about themes of teacher and student, and our humble chair is going to be a part of that battle. Closer, please. Closer. That expires in one week. You're not real FBI, are you? I'm still in training at the academy. Jack Crawford sent a trainee to me. Yes, I'm a student. I'm here to learn from you. Maybe you can decide for yourself whether or not I'm qualified enough to do that. Mm -hmm. That is rather slippery of you, agents, darling. Sit, please. Okay, so we haven't seen our chair yet, but we know its qualities. We know that its shape and size has allowed Jodie Foster to be lowered in the scene. Now that takes a huge psychological toll for us because we now know that he's standing above her, the camera looks down at her. This scene is about getting these themes of teacher and student, and we're going to see our chair here for the first time. And uh, I just want you to pay attention to these, these themes of the, the, the power struggle between them. What about it? Why don't you... Why don't you look at yourself and write down what you see? Maybe you're afraid to. A census taker once tried to test me. I ate his liver with some fava beans and a nice Chianti. You fly back to school now, little starting. Fly, fly, fly. 
So this scene really is about her being destroyed emotionally. She's now a child. And what I want you to notice with this chair is that it's now a metaphor for her. And it's collapsible. It's supposed to be mimicking her state of mind. Now, it's no, also no coincidence that all of the items on her and the chair are exactly the same color. This is about how our brain understands categories. Now, we're trying to make all of these elements come together and feel like they're, they're working together. So we've got this collapsible flimsy chair, and as she walks away, you'll actually notice that she's been directed to kind of stammer a little bit and look like she's, she's barely able to stand. So this chair is an extension of her. Our chair now has a meaning, it has a metaphorical meaning, and it's about supporting our character, and it's about supporting our narrative theme. Now, that's a really subtle example, and I'm sure some of you might be thinking, how does that apply to design? Let's just say that somebody was making Silence of the Lambs in space. You would still need to consider, when you designed a chair for this scene, you shouldn't be making some big chair that's really soft and leather and comfortable, because then it just makes it look like she's chilling out at you know, a golf club. So this chair is designed specifically to fit this need. Now, the next one I'm going to show you, and this is one that I, I can't tell you how excited I am about this. Um, a film that I love, Contact, has some of the best production and industrial design you will ever see in films. And it's not because the designs look really, really, really realistic, it's because they are laced with meaning. As I'm talking about industrial design for narrative, I need to give you narrative context so that we understand if we were designing for this film, we would know what narrative themes we would be trying to design for. So the first thing that happens in this movie is that Ellie, who is our protagonist, uh, her father dies when she's young, and she begins to resent the idea of God because she feels like if there was a God, why did he take her dad away? She becomes a dogmatic scientist. She's become stubborn, and all this, this dogma is rooted in her basic pain from losing her father, and she's emotionally broken. Then a message from the heavens arrives, and I'm using these emphasis here because these are cliche when I say it, but they're not cliche when they're embedded in the film. Uh, a message from the heavens arrives, an invitation for a single human to travel to an unknown dimension. The rest of the middle act is all about big questions of who should go, who represents humanity, should a scientist go, should a religious leader go, you know, what's the, the universal language of, of all beings, who gets to go. In the end, uh, obviously Jody gets to go. This scene is about Jodie Foster taking a leap of faith. It's the first time she has to remove herself from her dogmatic belief in science and face up to the possibility there's more. And in order for that to happen, in order for her psychology to go through that journey, she has to have a metaphorical rebirth. It's really important. This is her becoming a new person at the end of this film. Now in this scene, as designers, here is our role. Our role is to suddenly confront Ellie with a new uh, vision of science. She's always been defending it, saying it's the, the only way that people can live. But in actual fact, we now need to, to, to show the audience uh, through the cinematic filter and the design filter the emotions that she's now facing when looking at these industrial design items. So it's got to be terrifying. Our job is to breathe life into that. So in the second part of this scene, she has to step into the unknown. There's no going back at this point. She is alone. Our designs need to reinforce this isolation on her. And in the third act, we need her to leave behind her unhealthy scientific dogma, take a leap of faith, and come to a cathartic rebirth and be rewarded and saved. So. I'm now going to quickly show you two clips, and I want to give you context uh, because there's one other component in this scene that when we're designing, we need to be aware of, and that is the totem that shows up, and it shows up every time there's a scene that brings up the issue of faith versus science. So this, this scene, this is five minutes into the film. We're now going to build something that's going to hold all of these themes in one object. And that's fringe crossed paths with this guy before. I mean, there's something like that. Must really chap his ass, huh? Compass. Good for you, Al. You better keep this. Might save your life someday. Will you have dinner with me tonight? That smooth southern drawl of uh, Matthew McConaughey there, working his magic. Um, now, in that scene, uh, I'm, I'm bringing this up because it is really important. The selection of that item is not coincidental. It's a compass. He finds a compass in a fast food package, and then he just offhandedly gives it to her as a gesture, and it becomes a symbol of A, their, their relationship together, and B, the, the, 
this is them meeting each other, but they're about to realize pretty soon that one is like all about faith and one's all about science. They're in conflict for most of the film. And that compass, that guide, is going to be uh, playing in, a, in the crux of the scene with our chair. So this next scene is about introducing that unlike Silence of the Lambs, our chair is front and center and is a major character in the scene that we're about to see. Okay, look, I, I understand the reason for recording and documenting the mission, but I just I want to go on record one more time. Okay, the transmitted specs never said anything about any chair or a, a restraining harness or a survival gear. I mean, why can't we just trust the original? Doctor, both the IMC board and the SI team carefully reviewed the matter and concluded the design impact is negligible. Bottom line is. We are not putting anybody aboard this machine unless there is some sort of minimal protection. Minimal protection. End of story. Okay, so here we're seeing the introduction of the chair and the fact that Jodie Foster is now beginning to suggest, well, why can't we just trust the race that sent these plans? Why do we have to put a safety chair in there? So we are now giving permission to the audience to pay conscious attention to the chair. It's now under quite a lot of pressure to perform. So this is the next scene. This is now the scene that I'm talking about, the, the, the whole scene in itself. This is the one. Those were just setup scenes. This is the launch scene where she's finally going to go off and discover where this machine takes her. Okay, so in our story structure, if we had been given a decent brief that's actually relating to a real story, then our story brief, we would now be in the science in a new light section. This is the build up. So we now need to show Jodie Foster looking at science and being frankly terrified because this scene isn't going to be engaging for the audience unless we see this tension. Our journey to this chair, our journey to find new worlds, it should feel like this. If, you know, she's going to discover new places, like the Apollo missions. We've even got the same tunnel. That's the industrial decision. But this is a rebirth scene, so we need to execute her. So these subconscious associations, this is about building in the idea that she's basically going to die. Okay, now, now the vest. Uh, I just want you to see that this vest uh, doesn't really look very scientific deep down. It has other uh, intonations, and those other intonations are Joan of Arc and a knight's armor. So she's going off on a quest, and she's a martyr, and she's a saint, and let's not forget that saints died for their uh, beliefs. So once again, it's a subconscious association that really reinforces this journey that Jodie Foster's about to go through. She's not just a scientist on a journey. Her own inner journey requires that we get these associations. So what we're getting here 
is some new associations and the mechanical industrial design needs to support this because it's the way that we deliver these themes. Now, when you see her crossing this bridge, do you think it's a coincidence that the two assistants just stand there in that particular position? Do you think they forgot to follow her and then the director couldn't be bothered to reshoot that scene? Or do you think that we're supposed to be getting some metaphorical subconscious associations such as walking the plank? Now, she's about to go and leave this world and when you're out at sea in the abyss of, like, the, the, the big abyss of the ocean, which is just like the Earth at space, you're about to leave civilization. And this association makes it a lot more threatening for her. Add to that the fact that when she looks down, if she's walking the plank, the associations we're getting here are circling sharks. Look at the movement of all of those spinning items. There, there's, there's associations with uh, circling sharks. There's associations with guillotines, which connects with the, the neck design on her, um, on her vest. And there's also associations with Kraken. Now, when you watch those spinning things in the next scenes, just pay attention to how they look like tentacles, like octopuses, the way they spin. Um, so we're, we're layering in some themes here. Also, we get our first glimpse of the chair. Now, does that look like a design made by NASA? It doesn't. It looks like it's been constructed correctly. Excellent, it's done its job. But I would posit to you that given that we're in a rebirth scene and she's about to be executed, that we need to build associations with an electric chair. Add to that the fact that they plug her in. You actually saw her get plugged in. And then add to that that she's in something that represents a gas chamber. Uh, and then we're going to get another association with this thing when, in the next scene. Magnetic restraint is secure. All life support functions are normal. Roger that. Elliot. This is control. Do you copy? Elliot control, reading you five by five. I'm ready. Dynamics is... I can confirm the walkway retraction. I've got a visual on the door. Okay, so at this point it's fair to say that in our structure of this scene, she is alone. I think it's, she's pretty much isolated. She's in a tomb. It closes up, even the way that the door gets closed is designed to represent that rolling boulder that you see going across cave entrances. So she's gone from being outside of a bank vault that looks like a gas chamber. Bank vaults hold very valuable things. She gets into this thing, gets plugged into an electric chair, and then gets sealed up in a tomb. All of these things are associations with dying because she's about to go through a psychological and emotional rebirth. So I now want to draw a bit of attention to the, to, to the costume design here, actually. Um, and this whole time, there's been these kind of creepy dudes that are representing executioners behind her, subconsciously ex representing. Of course, we just look at them and think scientists, uh, you know, assistants. But let's look at these outfits. Now, if you had to make a subconscious association of danger and, you know, death, you don't want to necessarily put an actual executioner outfit on the scientist. But you do want to build a sense of threat. So you build in an association where you go, well, that costume reminds me of something that relates to danger. Uh, bomb shelter wardens, you only ever see them in any narrative in moments where people are about to get destroyed by bombs. Which means that, and there's these creepy associations that come with them, the gas masks, the death, war, etc. So. On one hand, they don't look like scientists. They're in these black cloaks. Their color scheme has been selected on the basis that it represents something very, very evil. Now, this is all happening subconsciously because on the conscious level, we've already committed that these guys are good guys. But if everything in the subconscious design is there to suggest unease, then we can build tension in the audience. Now, these are the subtle design decisions I'm talking about. We're encoding things in the design that you're not supposed to see consciously. Copy that control. IPV is secure. We 
We are at 30%. Copy that, 30%. It's that Kraken reference I was talking about. How you doing in there, Al? Now listen to the language being used. Is that you? That's a big affirmative. <sighs> Who let you in there, huh? A uh, higher power intervened. Well, I'm glad you came. Okay, so it's a very subtle thing, but even the language being used, a higher power intervened. We are now having subconscious ideas laced into us. Now, when that wor those wordings come in, we are forced, our brain has no choice but to generate all of the associations that it can think of with the material that it's being given. And it's being given thematic uh, wording that represents religious overtones. You can't avoid that. Your brain is doing this automatically on your behalf because that's what it's designed to do. Uh, something's happening. Language here, listen again. I, 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 I'm, there's, there's a light, do you see that? I'm seeing uh, something, something. I can't tell whether it's daylight or not. It's, there it is again, it's coming from the bottom. The material is changing, it's bordering on translucence. The system's intact. There's gotta be some kind of, some kind of uh, electromagnetic field. Are you reading this? Negative. We're saying only interference. I can't describe it. I can't even explain it. So at this point, our industrial design is supporting the the, the the fracture in her belief system. Right now, she's trying to marry science to the things that she's seeing. She's saying, I can't explain it. I think it's electromagnetic. She's still trying to cling to science when clearly there's something very uh, something very spooky happening. The metal is becoming translucent. That doesn't happen in the real world. This this language is, uh, is important because it, it shows us what our industrial design is supposed to be supporting. Oh, incidentally, sorry, there's one other thing, that I, I, just one frame I missed. Um, in that last scene where we introduce her into the chair, once again, the chair has a new, uh, is designed specifically to elicit a new association here, which is that science, she's locked into this chair. Does she look empowered and like somebody that's, uh, you know, about to go on a really good journey? Or does she look like a quadriplegic? She has literally been immobilized by science. It is grabbing her and she can't do anything about it. Even the hand controls that they've designed in there are designed specifically as if she wasn't able to move her arms. Now, you only design those kind of controls when you literally have somebody who can't actually move their arms. So when we see this, do you see an empowered traveler to another galaxy or do you see a quadriplegic? Okay, so the language that she's using when she gets dropped by the machine is, oh God. And she gets dropped and then she goes through a sequence which basically is reminiscent of what you would expect to see when you see the lights and you go through the long tunnel. All of this design, and including the seat, has been made in such a way that we can have a point of view shot from her angle and we can still see what's going on below our feet. So this chair had to satisfy many, many, many things. It had to satisfy the needs of the director, the needs of the cinematographer, the needs of the storyteller, the needs of the mechanical designer that needs to make it feel like it's real. This design is operating on so many goddamn levels, I'm actually in awe of what they've achieved here. And now I'm gonna move on to the next scene. By the way, this scene is the crux of it, because now our chair becomes a character, and I want you to pay attention to how the, the chair, the industrial design, now emotes.
let's break down how this chair suddenly becomes really important in selling this rebirth. So yes, we've got a chair that functions, but in this scene, look at the way that the chest plate could have opened in any number of ways. It could have had an under the arm disconnect. It could have been a, a move up disconnect. But instead, it's a disconnect that makes sense, or we believe in it, but look at what it looks like. Look at the position and the pose of that chair. Look how angry and aggressive and tantrum-like it is. And then, when we face it straight on and she looks at it for the first time and has to face herself and sees this angry, annoyed, scared, dogmatic scientist, sees a version of herself, it's like a clutching hand because it doesn't want to be left behind. Now, this journey that she's going on is an inner journey. So she's going to another universe, yes, but to make it emotive for the audience, it's got to be an inner journey. And this is representing that painful thing that we all go through when we actually have to change ourselves a little bit inside, how much that part of you that's clinging to something doesn't want to basically be let go of. And what that thing is for her is that scared little girl from when her dad died in the first scene. So the point that I'm trying to get across here is that basically um, our chair here, the entire industrial design setting of that space, isn't arbitrary. It isn't down to what looks cool. It's down to symbology. It's down to metaphorical references. Now, if you start to approach your design on the basis of A, yes, I need to make it work, but B, I really need to lace it with some sort of meaning, you suddenly have a new constraint for your design process. And that makes it incredibly easy to generate ideas that are aimed at something. Not making endless uh, variations for no reason until somebody goes, cool shape language. Like, the shape language is supposed to be representative of something. And this, in my opinion, is a great example of what it's representative of. It's supporting an emotional journey that we can actually feel. Contact is a masterpiece, and it's filled with this stuff. Every scene has been considered. Um, so the next film that I've got, and it's going to segue, uh, and then at some point it's not the ideal example, so we're going to leave Jodie behind and we're going to go with Lawrence Fishburne instead. Um, but Elysium, so narrative context, I can't tell you the narrative context because I'm not entirely sure there was much narrative. Uh, even Neil Blomkamp himself said after the film was made, he gets distracted by concept art and then tries to find ways to crowbar it into his movies. Now, this is the exact antithesis of what makes good stories. You make a good story, and then you make the concept art work to support it. Now, in Elysium, I want to just show the scene. I'm going to uh, sort of wind it forward. So in this point of the scene, Jodie Foster's a bad guy. She's about to kill a load of refugees that are trying to get onto her really, really fancy ring planet. We have a number of undocumented ships in bell. Good afternoon, Defense Secretary Delacour. Three undocumented ships are approaching Elysium airspace. Emergency orders six and seven are now in effect. Protocol 22. 15,000 kilometers and closing. What do you want us to do, ma'am? Activate Kruger. Uh, Ma'am, according to Executive Order 355, we are unauthorized to use our assets on Earth. I am authorizing you. Nine, seven, two, nine, seven. OK, so effectively here, this chair, it's, in, in my opinion, I found that when I watched this film, the moment this happened, I immediately lost all credibility for what was going on. Because I was like, why is the chair moving? Like, there's. She's, I can see quite clearly that all she's doing is looking at a big screen that everyone can already see. Why does she need to be moved four feet forward on a really heavy duty chair? And then to compound that, we then get another shot of the chair and it becomes abundantly clear that the chair has moved her to a position where she can't use any of the interfaces that are designed for her to use. This, this guy over here is completely on the opposite side and we know that this thing only moves forward and she can't reach that screen. I don't know why this this thing moves. So already I'm consciously pulled out of the sequence, and to add to that, its symbology is kind of lame. It's like, it's a big corporate chair, and she's a big corporate woman, but that's as far as the subtext goes. There's no real metaphors there. It's pretty, it's pretty blank, you know, cliche. So the next example I want to give uh, is actually uh, a film called Event Horizon. Uh, and I want to show this because for me, this is an example of where our designs and the qualities that we think are really cool can actually really damage something. And we should be aware of that, that, that something that we consider personally to be cool because we love 
animated stuff and tech and things can actually really undermine the actors, the scene, and the audience's attention. And I want you to pay attention to the captain of the ship drifting in from the rear of the ship over a giant dangerous chasm. I can't believe this is ridiculous. I've got more than my hand in the last six weeks, and I this shit. Wait, why can't we go to Mars, Captain? I mean, Mars has got women. And if the shit goes down, we'll be on our own. You know the rules, people. If someone drops the ball, we get the call. Now, let's go. Have you got a course plotted in? Yes, sir. Locked and cocked and ready to rock. Thank you, Lieutenant. Let's go. Smith, you follow me. Yes, ma'am. OK, so in this scene, he moves all the way back. Lawrence Fishburne does his best to act while this chair is turning at, like, one degree a minute. Uh, and then at the end of it, he reverses it and walks back the direction that he came at about five times the speed. Uh, it doesn't make sense to me. Plus, add to the fact that he just looks really stupid in it, which is fine if that was some sort of a metaphorical theme. But then, even then, it doesn't work because it's too distracting. It's too in your face. Uh, so this is another scene, and I just want you to pay attention again to two things. First of all, how silly Lawrence Fishburne looks uh, and how he can't really act, and he can't be the captain of the ship. He's the main, main character. He's one of the last people to die in this film. He's supposed to be kind of like our hero figure, but when every time we look at him, he looks like a, he's just, you know, basically can't even stand up. Stark. I'm picking up trace life forms, but I can't get a lock on a location. These readings are all over the ship. It doesn't make any sense. Okay. okay, we do it the hard way. Deck by deck, room by room. Start deploy the umbilicus. Smitty, fire up the boards in the war room. Is that? Mr. Justin, I believe you're up for a walk. Yes, sir. Now, the, the thing about that is also just notice, I'm pretty sure, I can't be sure, but I would love to meet this actor one day. I think he's realized how stupid this chair is, and when he leaves, he's decided to spin his chair to show how ridiculous this thing is. Because this thing spins... Justin, I believe you're up for a walk. ...like six yes, times before Captain Miller gets out of his chair. So, for me... Uh, when I was talking earlier about the, 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 the subconscious associations, now this film will, wouldn't be a, have been aware of this, but I want to illustrate what's happening under the surface of our conscious kind of uh, interactions with things when watching a film. If I just quickly cut together an edit that illustrates how my attention to the film gets degraded every single time the chair turns up and what it's actually doing to how I see this scene. Uh, and this is the edit that I made. So this is the previous scene, but with a little bit of extra context, which is them docking their ship to the event horizon. That's the main airlock we can dock in there. All right, Smith, use the arm and lock us onto that small antenna cluster. Go very carefully here. That is not a load-bearing structure. Here's now, Doctor. Everything five by five. Locked into the event horizon. Thank you, Smitty. Light them if you got them. Thank you very much, sir. It's dark. I'm picking up trace life forms, but I can't get a lock on a location. These readings are all over the ship. It doesn't make any sense. OK, we do it the hard way, deck by deck, room by room. Stark, deploy the umbilicus. Smitty, fire up the boards in the war room. Sir? Mr. Justin, I believe you're up for a walk. Yes, sir. Um, so the, the, the gist of this is that the, our chair, I, I hope that what I'm illustrating here is that our humble chair is actually contributing something. It's not, it's not a background prop. Even when it is a background prop, it's playing an important role. We are supporting the actors and the story. That's what we should be doing, okay? Not just making arbitrary shapes because they look cool or because they, they satisfy the whims of an art director that makes you do 30 variations before he tells you that he selected one because of some internal logic that he has as the art director. If the art director is working with a good story writer, he'll be able to immediately tell you the goals. So, the first chair was Silence of the Lambs. It had a very small part, but it did its role. It was logical, and 
it provided us with some kind of a backup for what Jodie Foster's state of mind was, really helpful. The second chair went above the call of duty. This chair was front and center, it had a lot of screen time, it took up entire shots, it had to carry a huge amount of responsibility, and the designer of this chair did his job admirably. Now, that was a great example, and then for Alicia, maybe they threw some token symbology in there, but basically it was so unfunctional that it was irrelevant. The gist of what I'm trying to say today is that logical design is about having your instruments tuned. Uh, narrated design is about contributing to the symphony, and the symphony is the story. Now, having everything in tune with your, with your instruments, that's the logic, making it functional, but that's half the battle. The rest of the battle is actually adding something to the experience that people are going to enjoy this in, because we are not designing for ourselves. We are not designing to satisfy our own personal fetishes here. Just because we geek out over a technical detail doesn't mean the world at large is going to geek out over a technical detail. We're designing for an audience, and if we're designing for an audience, we need to speak the universal language, which is a language of emotions. The stories we are telling require us to deliver emotional meaning in every design we make, even if that is just a chair. And that pretty much concludes what I talked about yesterday, and I really have no fucking clue what I'm going to talk about now. Uh, so I hope that for those of you who didn't see it, uh, that was interesting. Uh.